Hello everyone, and thank you for being here. My name is Justine Scott. I'm a master's student in the Department of Health Policy and Management here at the Harvard School of Public Health, and I'm also a member of the HSPH Women in Leadership Student Organization. I was born and raised in Washington, so I'm especially pleased to introduce Christine Gregoire, the 22nd Governor of Washington State. Christine Gregoire served two terms as governor, from 2005 to 2013. In her first term, Governor Gregoire balanced the state's budget as she expanded health care coverage to low-income children, led an effort to make government more efficient and accountable, planned to improve the education system, and launched an initiative to protect the waters of Puget Sound. Re-elected in 2008 and facing a multi-billion dollar shortfall brought on by the National Recession, Governor Gregoire again worked with the legislature to balance the budget while supporting job creation and economic growth. She also worked to support marriage equality and address climate change. Prior to serving as governor, Ms. Gregoire served three terms as attorney general, and she was the first woman to be elected to this position in Washington. As attorney general, she led negotiations in the Tobacco Master Settlement Agreement of 1998, a landmark settlement that required large tobacco companies to pay for smoking prevention and public health programs and restricted tobacco marketing to children. Christine Gregoire received her law degree from Gonzaga University. She is currently serving as a resident fellow at the Harvard University Institute of Politics at the John F. Kennedy School of Government. We are very grateful to have her here today to share her insights on leadership and public service. And before I turn the session over to Professor John McDonough, who will be moderating today, please join me in welcoming Christine Gregoire to the Voices in Leadership series at the Harvard School of Public Health. So, Welcome. Thank you. Governor Christine Gregoire, we're honored to have you here today. And Please excited. call me Chris. Chris, okay. And welcome to everyone here and everybody who's watching. So I'm going to start out with a few questions for you for about 25 minutes or so, and then we're going to open it up to the group. So get your questions ready. and Let's not have any awkward, quiet silences when we get to that point. But I want to start out. So Attorney General, Governor, 20 years, long time in big league politics in the United States at the state level and getting there and staying there and thriving and doing well. Is there a difference being a woman? What are some of the barriers? What are some of the obstacles? And how did you navigate them? And, uh, and what lessons can you share about that with folks here? So, you know, we, uh, well, let me tell you what happened on my first run for attorney general. Uh, I end up running against a male uh, who was a prosecutor in my state in the primary, and then a male who was prosecutor uh, in the general as well. And when we polled to ask what people thought about me running for office, the response was something to the following, uh, she's not tough enough to be attorney general. Uh, we were successful. Uh, it was the year of the woman, to anybody, any one of you who might remember that time frame. Uh, we were successful, um, and then I ended up, among other things, uh, being the lead negotiator on the tobacco settlement. And I don't think people then thought I was not tough enough to be attorney general. Uh, fast forward to I decided I'm going to run for governor, run for governor, and we basically do the same kind of poll to try and de decide where people are on the whole subject of a female running for governor. And the answer was, too tough to be governor. <laughs> so I thought to myself, you know, have they asked those questions of my male colleagues? And I don't think they had, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, and I, I want you to know a couple of things. One, as uh, attorney general, I came in, uh, I thought it was going to go like law schools, that we were going to gradually see that there would be, you know, like 50% women attorney generals, 50% male attorneys general. Basically, from the time that I've got, uh, I got into now, there's been a steady decline. I came in as governor uh, in 2005. And again, I thought there's going to be this steady increase of female governors. And we peaked in 2001. And there has been a steady decline. Um, I can't answer the question why. But I do believe that the electorate doesn't necessarily see women in executive positions. And interestingly enough, of the 20 female U.S. senators, half of them have run for governor and failed. But they then have run for the Senate and been successful. So apparently the electorate will see us in the role of a legislator, 
but they won't see us in the role as an executive. In part, I think it's because there aren't enough role models out there to show women in executive positions. So I've, I've had my challenges, but I want you to know um, I was elected to ch chair the National Attorneys General Association by my colleagues, bipartisan. I was elected to chair the National Governors Association, bipartisan, first woman as, as the chair of the National Association of Attorney General, second behind Janet Napolitano for the National Governors Association. So we are seeing some progress, but I couldn't be more discouraged while I see a steady growth in state legislatures, a steady growth in the U.S. Congress, to see a steady decline in the number of women who are serving in more executive positions at the state level, like attorney general or governor, is very disheartening. Uh, I think women need to see themselves in those positions. They should not doubt themselves. They should feel good about the fact they're well qualified and they ought to run. And as, as time goes on and we see more, I think we'll be fine, and I'll tell you why. As attorney general, I went out to a grade school, fifth grade, to teach these young students bait and switch. If you're familiar with it, basically, ad comes out, buy these tennis shoes. You go your first one in line at the store the next day. Oh, we're out. We're out. But we've got something else just a little more expensive for you. So I was trying to get the kids to understand what this was like. Get all done. Little guy tugs on my coat as I leave. And he said to me, I want to be just like you when I grow up. I thought, there's hope. There's hope. Move on, become governor. Uh, I go out to a school. Uh, I'm talking about, I can't remember what in specific. Little guy comes up, pulls on my coat and says, can a boy be governor of the state of Washington? <laughs> so I've seen my struggles and I see us still struggling in this country. Uh, there are not enough women on boards. There are not of the Fortune 500. It's a deplorable number. Uh, and unfortunately, the public sector seems to be mirroring it. And I think it's time for you to do something about that. So let's talk a little bit about your time as Attorney General. And as you mentioned, you were centrally involved in the whole master tobacco settlement in the late 1990s. Can you tell folks a little bit about that, what it was about and the role you played and what you learned during that process? And also then kind of from today's vantage point, look back and evaluate kind of what happened and what was achieved and what fell short. So it's 1994 when this began, and as we looked around what had happened in the private sector, there had been 40 years of litigation by individuals bringing civil lawsuits against the tobacco companies. Uh, about 800 lawsuits. Uh, of the 800, about two had succeeded, and then on appeal they lost. So no one had succeeded. And in the process, they had financially taken everybody to their knees. So you can imagine that's a formidable, formidable history to think that you're going to do anything different than those private sector uh, complaints had gone. Mike Moore, Mississippi, filed the first lawsuit. I had a, a meeting in my office, and uh, the tobacco lawyers asked to come see me. I personally was as upset as I could be about the predatory practices that I saw the companies using on youth, whether it was Joe Camel, Marlboro, Marlboro Man, you would watch young people go down the street with trinkets and trash on. Uh, as I would drive into New York to do the negotiations, every taxi would have a tobacco ad. All of the skyscrapers would have phenomenal pictures of Joe Camel or the Marlboro Man. Uh, and I was upset about what was going on. And yes, we did have some secret documents that an individual who was employed took out under his coat every night, had made copies, and then returned them. And one was a study of youth and the maturation of youth brains and how addictive they can be. And yes, as we get older, we become less prone to addictiveness. And that, once that was found, that was shut down and all the documents were taken to England. Um, so I, we had access to these things. And so that was really my motivation. The company's motivation was they were very concerned about Medicaid reimbursement. The idea of them paying back for uh, deaths caused by tobacco-related illnesses really was a chilling effect on them. So they came in to convince me not to file because it became public that I was considering it. With respect to youth advertising, the line they gave me was this particular company said they had not begun the predatory practice in marketing against, with youth, 
But if the other guys were going to do it, then they should be able to do it too. So I said, okay, so somebody else is robbing, and because they're robbing, you get to rob too? That's not how it works. That's not how it works. But then we got to the heart of their argument, and it went like this. By the way, with many documents to prove their case, that in fact, in fact, we were not losing money in Medicaid. We were saving money in Medicaid. Because if these people had lived longer, they would have been very unhealthy in nursing homes, would have cost taxpayers much more than because they died earlier in life. To which I said, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> that is your argument. And they said, look at the data. The data proves it. And I said, I can't wait to have you tell a jury what you just told me. The meeting is over. I'm out of here. You can show yourselves to the door when you're ready. And I left, and I went out and filed the case. Um, it was a little frightening to file the case because I had to use all the money I had in my antitrust fund and then I wouldn't have any money if I lost the case. Um, but it, I thought it was worth the risk. So we got some help from the private sector, had to, couldn't have done the cases without, subject of much controversy by the way, but we did, we did. Because we met of in, the fees they collected. Because of the yeah. fees, right. Met in Crystal City. Uh, met under secretive circumstances with phony names, checked into an hotel. I thought it was all a little bit much for me, to say the least. We go in and have the meeting, and uh, the tobacco lawyers say our clients would, are willing to negotiate. There were f five attorneys general. We thought they were not really serious. So we took a break, and we came back in, and we said, if you, make a, if you have your CEOs show up, and if you make a commitment to get rid of Joe Camel and the Marlboro Man, we'll take you serious. Well, you should have seen the look on the faces that we were out of our minds. The next day, we had a CEO, and they agreed to give up Joe Camel and the Marlboro Man. We knew we were on legitimate grounds. So we began negotiations. I negotiated all the public health issues, full authority to FDA and so on. They wanted out of class action lawsuits, so we had to go to Congress. Spent much time in Congress. There were about two lobbyists per member two lobbyists per member, you can only imagine. Uh, John McCain, Senator McCain had the case, uh, or had the, the bill. Uh, he uh, introduced his own version of it, which was really quite similar, and it ultimately failed in Congress. So then, um, disgusted by the whole thing, we got back to the table in very secret negotiations and began in earnest. 49 consecutive Mondays, you can imagine what that's like with uh, children. Uh, I would uh, take the red eye back on a Sunday night, and I'd be back uh, by Saturday morning to watch my youngest play soccer. Um, we negotiated long and hard. Uh, $206 billion, by the way, of the heart of it for 25 years, though it goes in perpetuity. Largest settlement in the history of the world, then and now. Um, additional funds to go to what we call the Strategic Contribution Fund to those states that had played a major role. Uh, obviously, we got the most, which, by the way, we put into what we call a life sciences discovery fund used to give grants for new, innovative things to do in healthcare. I am proud of that, okay? <laughs> I'm not proud of other things, but I am proud of that. Uh, and then money for what we call the Legacy Foundation. Uh, and if you're not familiar with that term, it's the truth campaign. To go out there and to convince youth they think you're stupid and dumb. They're using these predatory tactics on you because they think you're stupid and dumb. And are you really going to let them do that to you? Long story short, the decline in youth smoking is dramatic in my state, but in the country. And we also have enjoyed a good decline in adult smoking. I'm very proud of that. When we finished the negotiation and were to announce, in light of the earlier question, um, we were in there and we putting the documents itself before we went to the White House to see then President uh, Bill Clinton uh, and make the announcement in D.C. into envelopes to send off to each of our respective colleagues who then had to say whether they wanted in on the settlement or not, and they all did in the end. Next day, front page above the fold announcing the settlement, uh, they identify each of my male colleagues, you know, uh, Grant Woods, Attorney General, Arizona, and at the end it's an Ann unidentified woman. That would be me. Um, <laughs> 20 years later, they have republished it. 
uh, and they have identified me as Christine Gregoire, lead negotiator and attorney general for the state of Washington. Anyway, just in a reference to the previous question, couldn't, manage, uh, couldn't imagine that a woman would be the lead negotiator in this lawsuit. Reflecting back, I'm back, discouraged. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm discouraged. How come? You know, there was a big fight by the National Governors Association and the National Conference of State Legislators. Who were these upstart attorneys general? They're getting all this money and they think they're going to tell us where to use the money? That's our money and we're going to decide what to do with it. And formidable, formidable. So unlike four cases that had settled before this, we were the next case up. We were in trial throughout all the negotiations. Um, we had to say, okay, governors and legislators will decide how the money is spent. And the history is not very good. Securitization came up as a, lug in my opinion, ugly way to use the money. And unfortunately, far too many states have securitized. Before I became governor, they securitized about a quarter of ours. It was a knock, knock down, drag out fight between myself and the then governor and the then leader, majority leader in my Senate. And during the deep recession, they tried to get me to securitize the rest of it. And I said, boy, you better have enough votes. And you have no idea how loud and long I can scream to the public if you ever give me a bill like that. Thank goodness they didn't. Um, but that securitization, in my opinion, is the most disappointing thing that could have been done. And there will be long-term consequences, by the way, to those states. But then the rest of the money that wasn't securitized, if you're a lawyer and you do a case, a public lawyer, and you do a case, whatever money you get should be used to remedy the wrong. That's just fundamental. And that is not what has happened. Uh, far too much of it has been used for other purposes. We set up a, a health care fund in our state to make sure all the money went to health care. Um, and we gave a lot of money to prevention with respect to children. The recession kind of blotted that out, to be perfectly honest with you. I hope we can recapture it coming out. But my biggest disappointment, here, here's the greatest opportunity. We got rid of all the marketing stuff, the sponsorships, the Joe Camels, the others. We got rid of all that stuff, all their organizations that were hiding documents. I'm proud of all that. But I am not proud how we used that money. It should have been used for health care. That was to remedy the wrong. Had a court said where the money should go, it would have gone exactly there. So you went then from being attorney general, you went over to the other side to become <laughs> the governor. And you found yourself in the end of the last decade in the worst recession since the Great Depression. And what was that like? And what were some of the most difficult choices and decisions you had to make leading your state through that horrible, painful period of time? It's the most difficult time I've ever had in my professional career. Um, I, I'd spent a career in public service and very committed to uh, particularly children's issues. And here we were having to confront. We were the first state in the country in my first term to have all children have health care in Washington state. And that issue is now teed up, do we cut that? Thank goodness we did not. But I want you to know it was a struggle. But um, we had an, let, me give, let me give you an example. In a biennial budget, $32 billion budget, we had a $9 billion shortfall. You must understand about 80%, 75 to 80% of a state budget, there's nothing you can do about. You don't have any leeway. It's basic education protected by the Constitution. It's Medicaid. It's a number. It's, it's uh, you know, debt service. It's um, any time you have an increase in your population for um, anything like health care and so on, you have to do that in your education system, what have you. So about 75 to 80 percent. The 20 percent can't absorb $9 billion. We tried during the course of it two cents on a can of pop for five years only, dedicated to education, failed at the polls. Lesson learned, don't, don't be asking for anything from the public in the worst recession in history. So it was, it was, it was grueling. I want you to know one of the tools I used and how it came about. Medicaid, you can't cut. Um, there are some programs that Washington State had offered that are voluntary programs. One of them is podiatry. So it came up to cut the whole program because basically what was on the chopping block is anything that's not required, cut it. And the thought 
struck me in, in that particular moment, who am I and what happens to me if you cut it? Um, and so my policy person said, well, here, here's probably who you are, and actually knew the answer to the question. And then, of course, the answer came that without podiatry services, that person might lose their foot. That was a wake-up call. So the word went out from my cabinet, you come in, you're going to offer up a cut. That's a human service related cut. I want to know who I am and what the impact will be. But because I didn't want to make budget decisions on numbers, but I wanted to make it understanding the human impact. So it was hard. The other one was public health, because I know how important this is to you. It, legislators, you can speak to this better than I, live in a two to four year segment. They don't live six, eight, 10, 12, 20 years out, and for reasons that are obvious, okay? Preventive things, training things, are not things that are at the top because they don't see a return on it. Okay, just put yourself in their head for a moment. So funding public health was a real chopping block exercise. So what I did is I went out to see what was happening at the local level, who implements it. We don't do it, right? But we give them money to make sure that they're, they're doing it. And they were cutting. Well, we had already gone through one scare, uh, and I had learned through that, and thank goodness I had, the one thing you know you have to have in public health is your inherent structure. If you break down the structure, you don't recoup overnight when you have whatever you might have. And so I was determined we were not going to diminish the structure. But I also couldn't send a message to locals that if you cut, I replenish, because we were in no position to do that. So we had to make some deals there. But it was uh, so difficult a time that I don't have term limits in my state. And the question that was asked of me was when I said I wasn't going to run for a third term, if I had not been through the recession, would I have run for a third term? Well, I can't answer that question. Uh, but I will tell you, it took, it took everything I had to get through it, to try and develop the economy, to take all the cuts, to try and get the nonprofits and the faith community to step up and help fill the net because of what we were having to do. Um, so I have done a lot to put the structure in place. Most sound public pension system in America right now, most sound public trust fund for unemployment insurance, uh, a rainy day fund. We did a lot of things. We've eliminated six institutions. The last one we eliminated was one in, in 20 years ago. Now, a completely reformed corrections. You know what? We made it lemonade. We did things we could never do in a good economic time. And what we did was good and right and should be done. So while it was emotionally draining and we had to break up in some times because people were crying so much in my policy and, and financial sessions, on the other hand, we took the challenge and we said, we're going to go now. We're going to make use of it. We're going to get things done that we otherwise could never accomplish. And so while all that was going on, while you were in the midst of all of that, several thousand miles away in Washington, D.C., <laughs> Congress and the new administration were attempting to achieve some form of comprehensive health reform that led to the Affordable Care Act. What role did you have in that? What was it like? What was going on in your mind relating to other governors, to your state? What was that like for you, that whole process, and what impact do you think you were able to have on it? So we had been out in front in a couple of ways. Prior to my having uh, been governor, we had tried the in, we had tried reform without the mandate, and failed miserably, failed miserably without learned, the individual mandate. Individual mandate, and learned that you can't you can't make it happen without it. Uh, and I know it's all debated out there, but I'm telling you, we're an example. in P.S. I did file an amicus brief in the U.S. Supreme Court when the case was pending, and in the case, in my, our experience is quoted in the case. Um, you, 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 you just can't have people come on when they're sick and then go off, come back on when they're sick and then go off. It, won't, it just doesn't work. So we, I had that understanding. I knew health care reform was coming. I mean, you can hear it out there. So my You talked to Barack Obama about it during the I primary did. campaign. I did. Mm -hmm. At length. At length. At length. Uh -huh. um, so I put up a task force of legislators 
Republicans and Democrats, I said I'd chair it if they'd all come, which doesn't normally happen. And we delved, delved into this really thoroughly. And we began the process of health care reform and getting us out from under, uh, you know, I wanted to go to, and so did my colleagues, outcome-based reimbursements for Medicaid, okay? Not fee-for-service. And so we were trying to move the system along that way in particular. Um, I have, believe it or not, a group of people now that look at procedures and ask whether there is any positive outcome for a patient in that particular procedure. And if there isn't, we don't pay for it. Now, you know how controversial that is. And we're making it work. We're making it work. Maybe you shouldn't tell anybody because <laughs> then they'll get rid of it. But it's working, and it's working well. So we had been through all that. So when the ACA came, we were front and center in the middle of the debate because of things that we'd already done. We have a group health cooperative back in our home state that became a very significant issue to be discussed in, in Congress. And I became a big advocate, but I also said, if you, don't do, if you do not do the mandate, it won't work. Trust us. So off we went. So along comes the ACA, and we had really no partisan divide because we had already set the train in motion. We were already making reform work. This was just going to allow us to do some more than what we'd already been able to do. But you also you also had a role on the national stage because you were chairing the National Governors Association right. with 50 governors of different parties caught up on both sides. What was what was that like for you? Oh, very frustrating. I tried to get us uh, to see if we couldn't agree because I said that's what the role of governors is. It's, you know, it's one thing to talk about it in D.C. It's another thing to implement it out here. So we ought to get engaged and get involved. And we ought to do it bipartisan. And if we do, imagine, imagine how forceful we can be in this debate. Oh, you can give me an F on that one. That did not work. How come? But, you know, it became one of the most partisan issues I have ever seen in the National Governors Association. And the influence of uh, our respective, um, you know, congressional members in, in pushing us to not agree and so on was much more dramatic and much more um, forceful than anything I'd ever seen. And you need two-thirds of them to agree to do anything. Correct. Right? So that was just not possible right. in that environment. And, and probably one example I can give you that probably, you may be the only group in America I can talk to about dual eligibles, right? So dual eligibles is a big issue for all of us, but they can't even, they don't know what we're talking about back there. But we said how important it was to get a handle on dual eligibles. We had the Republican Governors Association and the Democrat Governors Association both write the exact same letters saying, this is what we want you to do with, deal with dual eligibles, but we couldn't get, I couldn't get them to agree to sign one letter saying the exact same thing. That's how divided we were. Kind of an early indication of what was to come. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Both in the legislative process and the implementation. But you know, we had high hopes, I have to admit, we had high hopes on implementation. Mm -hmm. Because again, in the room, in private, when no one else is in there, we talked about the adverse impact if you didn't opt in to Medicaid coverage on DISH. I know you know what that is. You know, we, we talked about all of those things. And we all knew it. We all understood it. Uh, but then we walked out of that room, and it was all politics all the way, all the time. Mm -hmm. OK. So um, it's time for the audience to step in. Does anyone want to start? Yes. Question sent in from an audience who cannot be here with us today, but I want to uh, give the question to Governor Chris. Uh, my name is Catherine Hoy, and I'm a master's student in po health policy at HSPH. As a Washington State resident, I greatly appreciate your leadership and efforts in environmental protection and public health safety related to nuclear policy. What are your current policy recommendations for our state's Hanford nuclear power plant cleanup? What are your thoughts on how we can prevent harm to human health, such as cancer and reproductive health issues, and the environment and advocate for communities detrimentally impacted by exposure to nuclear radiation as leaders in public health? Wow. <laughs> So the Hanford Nuclear Reservation is about 600 square miles located in eastern Washington in what is a fairly desert-like uh, area. Um, the Manhattan Project uh, came there with the construction of what we call the B plant reactor. 
It was the plutonium producing reactor that was responsible for the bomb dropped, one of the bombs dropped over Japan. It went from one to, in the Cold War, to nine nuclear reactors. When they got rid of the waste, they put it into 177 underground storage tanks. M the vast majority of them are single shell tanks. Their life expectancy is 20 years. As the peak of production got up, they started mixing what was in the tanks, and they didn't keep good records. So they don't know even what's in the tanks. And obviously, we have leakers. We have 60-some leakers of the single shell, and now for the first time, we have a leaker in the double shell. It's located on the Columbia River, the lifeblood of the Pacific Northwest, British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana. It's for irrigation. It's for fishery resources. Yes, it produces electricity, but can you see how important this is? We have an issue there, what we call the downwinders, folks who live downwind from the reservation who have health-related problems or even have died, and we can't explain why, and the assumption being that it's related to Hanford. I went in and negotiated the first uh, agreement to clean up a nuclear reservation in the country, the belief being that we participated in this, but now the country is responsible to clean up behind itself. Um, I did that. They de started decommissioning in 1987 of all of the plants. In 1989, I got the agreement, the first, the last of its kind, because they were upset they'd actually agreed to what they'd agreed to. We have been patient and patient and patient because the science is not there to tell us how to do what we need to do. We're trying to build a vitrification plant to glassify it. You know what happened in Nevada with regard to the deep geologic repository. It's politically highly charged, it's billions of dollars, it's science at its peak of how do we deal with this. But you know what? Uh, as a state, we deserve to have the place cleaned up. And that will be our position no matter who's governor or who's attorney general. And the, and the frustration now is our patience has worn thin. The science is going to have to be there. They have to get. They've taken the liquids out of the single shell tanks. They've now got capacity in the double shell tanks. It is not something you can look away from and do nothing about. It cannot jeopardize our agriculture. We export around the globe. So um, we've got to, we, we the country, have got to live up to our responsibility to the people of Washington State and surrounding for having participated in the first place. Now it's the job of the federal government, like it is any individual polluter to clean up after themselves. It's the job of the federal government to do the same. Okay. Thank you. Who else? Wait for the uh, microphone. Governor, it's been a pleasure to see you at various events around the Harvard campus, and uh, we are thrilled to have you here at the School of Public Health. My name is Michael, and I am a MPH student at in the law and public health track. And I would just ask you to reflect on your experiences and tell us three different uh, essential qualities of leadership that you believe have really uh, transformed your career. So <clears throat> I, I'll, I'll give you three things, I think. And I don't know if I had time to think about this. I might come up with a little bit different, but I doubt. Okay? One, you have to be, as a leader, you have to be decisive. Now, that doesn't make you, you, you don't have the authority or the right to make decisions without being well informed and studied and let, you know, differing opinions come before you. But you have to be decisive. So, that's what you are elected to do if you're uh, the executive, and it's important that you do so. But it's the how you do it that is really quite critical. Do you invite people in with opposing views? Do you take them into consideration? Do you respect them? Do you understand that the advice that you'll be given is probably biased no matter who you hear from, no matter who you hear from? And remember now, as I always say, those questions that come before a governor are not ones that are easily answered. They wouldn't be there if they were. So it's got to be some controversy. So let's hear what it is. Let's deal with it and treat everybody in the room with respect. So decision making. Um, I'm a big believer in risk taking. Uh, I just think, particularly you all here, and what you're going to face in the area of healthcare, 
uh, let alone the other issues that we face as a nation and a world, but on health care in the world, we are quite challenged when it comes to health care. Um, as a nation, we are challenged. We pay far too much for too little in return. Um, and we've got a long way to go in one of the most politicized arenas ever and in an area that money, money, money unfortunately drives it far too much and it isn't driven by what's good right for the patient. Okay, So I think you have to take risks. Now they have to be well informed risks uh, but I'm a believer in risk taking because you cannot address, you cannot be a good innovative problem solver today but you have to be if you're not going to be willing to take risks. And three, and this is my uh, comment with respect to DC, is collaboration uh, and compromise are always, always in the best interest of the people that you serve. So I was, happened to be a Democrat, my House and Senate were Democrat, we'd be doing very big issues and I would invite in the leaders of the Republican House and Senate. M my Democrats were never happy with me but as I said to them, if I'm going to do policy, I don't want it democratic policy for when the Republicans take over, and they will, I don't want it automatically repealed. I want policy to stand the test of time. Two, sure they're minority, but you know what? They represent Washingtonians too. And I, I'm not the democratic governor to do only what Democrats want. I'm here to govern for the entire state. So bring them in, let's hear their perspective, let's understand compromise is not a dirty word. In my opinion, the country was founded on compromise. I don't believe any of our founding documents came about as a result of one dictator, but were compromised. And let's get something done. Now is not the time to stay idle. Now is the time to really get out there and do something. So you forced me to say three, and those are my three. <laughs> so, so you mentioned risk taking. Uh, President Obama looks like he's taking a risk tonight in terms of immigration. Is that a risk too far or a risk worth taking, do you think, opinion on that? Well, would I do it? Is that what you're asking? Should he do it? Is that a risk too far? Do you think you have a you view know, on that? So. How would you evaluate that? We choice? have needed immigration reform for how long? Yes, we need it for the workers in our respective states. The business community needs it. Today, Microsoft in Washington State has located a facility up in British Columbia simply because of this issue. Simply because of this issue. So those people cross the border all the time and come down to where the location is, Redmond, but they have to locate in Canada in order to... This is ridiculous. It is time for us to do comprehensive immigration reform. And I don't, I don't think it's new. I remember Janet Napolitano coming out early in the first term and saying, I've been assigned the responsibility to lead the way. And I put together a whole group of people from Washington State, first state to do it, and say, let's talk about it. Well, that's almost six years ago now. So time's up. Uh, I'm with him. Uh, time to say, let's move on. But I hope, rather than reacting inappropriately and saying that this is a, you know, the launch of a, a war. Monarchy, I think monarchy or we're now going to impeach him or anything of the like, I think now's the time for them to say, we're going to take back the leadership role. We're not going to just give it over to the President of the United States and we're going to do what's right and we're going to show the American people we're ready to lead. Okay. Thanks. Who else? Yes, behind you. Thank you, Governor Gregoire, for coming to speak with us today and uh, also for your public service. Um, my guess is that there's, in the room, there might be a little bit of cognitive dissonance hearing you talk about uh, the, accomplish the, the great ac accomplishments that you've achieved uh, in public service with the kind of environment that exists today. I mean, you've uh, done so many great things in a bipartisan fashion. I think many of us are discouraged if any, any of us who have been following politics are, are discouraged. Um, public confidence in the ability of the public sector to actually accomplish things has been lower today than I think ever recorded. What do you say to people who perhaps still believe that the public sector can accomplish things but are uh, nervous or discouraged about perhaps entering it themselves? So what I would say is you're watching and listening to D.C. too much. 
<laughs> come on out. Come on out to Washington State. But come on out to any state. Come on out to Seattle, Washington. Or come on out to any city. Come on out to King County. Or come out to any county. The fact of the matter is, I, I, I'm discouraged too, by the way, in D.C. I'm not discouraged about what I see going out, on out there across the country. And it's not as if I have this view alone. One of my colleagues, a fellow, was chair of the Republican uh, National Committee under Ronald Reagan, Frank Ferenkoff, uh, who his entire study group was dedicated to how do we get back to the old way of standing on the floor of the Senate or the House and you know, going after each other based on policy disagreements and then going out and having a beer or doing whatever and enjoying each other's company. So he, he says the same thing. But what I don't want you to get discouraged about is your career doesn't have to start and end in Washington, D.C. If you really want to do exciting, fun, interesting, risk-taking, progressive things, come on out, cities, counties, states are where it's at. We're the laboratories. Congress follows our lead. So if you want to really lead, come on out to us, because that's where the leadership is taking place. Don't you agree? <laughs> <laughs> OK. Who else? Yes. Where are you from in Washington State? I was born in Seattle, but I went to school in Spokane. OK. Yeah, just the both sides. Yeah. So you said you're discouraged about the position of women um, in leadership positions. And I wonder what advice you would give to women who are launching their careers and perhaps interested in pursuing those positions and what they could do or what they should do. So I'll tell you one thing that I have observed because I've seen it in my daughter, OK? Um, is that women have a tendency to think, I shouldn't do that job, or I shouldn't run for office because I haven't done everything that I should do before I do that. Um, example, I argued my first case before the United States Supreme Court as an assistant attorney general seven years out of law school. Now, on a First Amendment case, I hadn't done anything on First Amendment, right, other than law school. Talking? Uh, a long time ago. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I could have said, no, I'm not ready. I don't want to do this case. Or I could have said, this is fun. This is exciting. I'm going to work my buns off, and I'm going to do this case. I chose the latter route. Because I did, the next big thing that came along in that office came to me. And then I got promoted to be the first woman deputy. Because I took the risk and was willing to do those things, even though I wasn't confident that I was ready or wasn't the most well-versed in the First Amendment. So now, my daughter is the example. My daughter was asked to consider running for Seattle Port Commission. Uh, and she said, you know, I'm, I just don't feel qualified for it, Mom. So I said, OK, let's look at the incumbent, who all happen to be male. Let's look at their resumes. And then let's put your resume up against it. I don't need to go through her resume, but it's nice. So, OK? <laughs> And I, I, just, I just laid it out on the table. And I said, now, what do you think? And she said, well, I think I'm as qualified as they are. And I said, well, I think you're more qualified. But that's OK, as long as you think you're as qualified. And they ran. Now, why won't you run? She ran and she won. So I think women really have to have more risk-taking, more confidence that, yes, I can do it. You folks do, males, generally, to which I applaud you, to which I applaud you. Now I'm just asking. The females to have the same self-confidence, the same risk-taking, go out there and serve like you did in the Massachusetts legislature. Do tell though, what's it like to <laughs> what's it what's it like to stand up before the Supreme Court and argue a case? I mean, how does that feel? What is it? What's it like? What was surprising about that? Do Professionally, the most scary thing I've ever done. I've I've done four cases. Um, I'll never do another. I've won all four. So time to quit. <laughs> but so you've done it four times. Four now. times. So what do you notice about it? What's, what's, so it, what's let me tell standing you, up there? And if you go to any court in the US, right, the, the court, the judge, is always physically up higher than you are, right? Well, that's because they have, to, they have to be more powerful than you are, right? US Supreme Court is right there, right in front of you. 
and they're as close as you are to me. And they're in a curvature, so you think that they can almost read off your notes. And at first you get distracted and you think, well, this is more like a conversation until whack. <laughs> and I remember uh, a case where I'm, uh, they're up arguing and I'm second case up, so I'm on deck. And uh, one of the guys from the Department, U.S. Department of Justice, Solicitor General's Office, which argue all the time, is up there and getting destroyed by Justice Scalia. All I could think was, Scotty, beam me up. Uh, and I've got 400 lawyers. Why didn't I give this case to one of them? Um, so get up there, argue the case. First case I did was the First Amendment case. Uh, next case is a just to show you how public service is in answer to your question. Second case is a Clean Water Act case. Third case is assisted suicide with thousands of people outside uh, picketing on the front steps of the, court, of the Supreme Court. And the fourth one is a foster care case. Now, where do you get that diversity of experience, right? So those are the four, four cases. Each time, I would feel the same, I don't know why I do this to myself. Why am I standing here doing this? And each time I would walk outside, first was my mom, then each of my daughters and my husband, and they would turn to me on the top of the steps of the Supreme Court and say, how do you feel? And I would say, I love being a lawyer. <laughs> so it's scary as all get out, and if you don't get destroyed in there, it's exhilarating and fun and nothing like it. And you didn't get destroyed? You what? You didn't get destroyed any time? No. No? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you won four out of four? I did. You did? Okay. All right. You know what, you know what was very interesting, just as a little uh -huh. tidbit, y'all, is in one case, my Supreme Court had ruled against the state 9-0. I hadn't been involved in the case. And the U.S. Supreme Court took it. So 9-0 against the state. My last case. And the U.S. Supreme Court ruled 9-0 for the state. Uh, we have researched that. We don't find any other case where that has happened. So, so I'm done, but it's, it was a good ride. Yeah. So talk about one of the least pleasant parts of politics for most people, which is raising money Ugh. and how it's <laughs> changed and what impact it had on you and what you see particularly in the new money environment, which frankly I've never seen before over the past few years, what, what, what do you, what's your view about money in politics? I'm very concerned about this. You know, I'm concerned about gerrymandering. We could talk about this. I'm concerned about the attitudes in Washington, D.C., but I'm very concerned about money. I don't want people to think that if they don't have money or if the perception can't be, they can't be bought, uh, that you can't run for office in America. Uh, so I got in in a time when I remember my first sit down, I was naively going to run for first office as a statewide office, That's probably not the smartest thing to do now, but anyway, I'm running for attorney general and we're sitting there talking and they say you're probably going to have to raise about 500 and I'm thinking, God, $500, do I know enough people that can get, well no that wasn't the number Chris, it's 500,000. Uh, my last election between he and I was almost 50 million. Um, to show you what has, that just, I mean, obviously two different offices, but still the dramatic, and now since then, in two years, it's even much more dramatic than that. Um, I'm not a fan in any way, shape, or form for Citizens United. Um, and I, well, people say, well, it's not the cause. Okay, okay. I just want you to look at how much money went into races before and after. And what was the intervening, you're the, this is what you do for a living. What's the intervening thing? I can find nothing else other than Citizens United. First thing I would ask Congress to do, and, and th I think they ought to have done it a long time ago, is absolute total transparency. The American people ought to see how much money is coming in from whom, from whom, and make the call whether they want their person to be, but, you know, in, in relationship owing their office to that person, entity, groups, whatever it may be. If that's what the public wants, okay. But they need to be informed about what's going on with regard to that. I'd say raising money, if, uh, do you have any idea how much time it takes when you're running, for example, for governor? On average, I would say no less than 75% of your time is spent raising money. I, I think you ought to be out there meeting the people, hearing the people. Um, and then it only happens at the end when you're having to do debates and so on and so forth that you actually get some freedom away from the raising of the money. 
Uh, but there's an adage, you probably would say this too, uh, no money, no message. So, and it's true. I mean, you have to raise the money. Now, having said that, been negative, let me be positive. I was shocked. I was absolutely shocked at how much I could raise. If people believe in you, if people believe in you, they will contribute. My, my most po positive thing that I can share with you is I would get a check uh, and it would be written so that you could see this is a very elderly person and it's five dollars. Do you know how much important that is? To me that's as important as a five thousand dollar check from somebody who's 45 and has lots of money. So that's participation in the process. That's what I think electoral politics ought to be about. You can't get rid of the money because you can't be self-funding. I'm in no position to self-fund. But I, I just think we're headed in the absolute wrong direction with Citizen United. It's not going to change anytime soon. But the least we can do is be absolutely transparent with the voters. You had a nail biter, didn't you? <laughs> in 2008. I'm so happy you brought this up. Would you? We, I just. I mean, it was. Yeah. It was a nail biter that. Do you know what he's referring to? Go for it. So. Um, you get yourself in a mindset when you run for office, it will be done on election day, election night, or at worst the next day, right? Two recounts, I learned I was governor on December 23rd. Uh, I lost the first count uh, by a couple hundred votes, second count by 40 votes. I won the third count by 128 votes. This one is, the first one is an automatic recount by machine. The second one I pay for and was uh, a hand recount. And what they had found is some votes, significant number of votes were missing in King County. The King County folks had screwed up. That went to the Supreme Court. Should they be counted? My motto was, if I lose, at least let every vote be counted. Then we have a lawsuit. Lawsuit theory on the other side is illegal. Um, um, folks who'd been in jail and hadn't gotten their rights restored, had voted. I had just come off being attorney general. I thought, that's an interesting theory, isn't it? Seriously, they think they voted for the girl cop. Probably not, <laughs> but we'll see. Go to trial, they, they choose an Eastern Washington, very conservative judge, so they really got their day in court. Um, they took four depositions, and none of them voted for me, okay? Uh, and I picked up four more votes. And um, so I won by 133 out of almost 3 million votes counted. Refresh, refresh, refresh. <laughs> ugly, ugly, ugly time. Um, and I went for it, it, it that, first, that first legislative session, I went for it in gusto because I thought, you know, the lawsuit may take it away from me. So if I'm only here six months, I'm going to get something done. I look back and I say thank you to that because I did get really big things done, the largest transportation package in the history of the state. I, I would have, otherwise I would have thought, I have four years to do this, right? No, I may have six months. If so, I'm going to get it done. The Life Sciences Discovery Fund with the tobacco money, on and on. So, but I wouldn't wish that on anybody, to be perfectly honest What's with you. What's it like? I mean, are you ready to jump off a building or something? I mean, how, how awful? How, how, do you get, how do you get through it day to day? Oh, it was ugly. The, and you no. don't sleep and you're tired. And I finally said to the family, who took it harder than me, we're out. We're gone. So we went to Oregon. And we're going to go skiing. First day, we put all our clothes on, get a knock at the door. There's a security officer from the state patrol. I open up the door and he says, good morning, governor. We all burst into tears, hugged this poor man, <laughs> and uh, off we went. And the re-election went fabulous. I learned that night uh, that I was, yay, was my biggest thing. That night I learned I was governor uh, for, uh, for the re-elect. So I wouldn't wish that kind of election closeness on anybody. Okay, so, so on that high note, we're, we're almost done. Um, before I ran for office, somebody said to me, in before an audience said, every one of you should consider running for office, for public office. And someone said that to you, too. So would you like to tell all of these people <laughs> that they should consider running for public office and why? Yes, I would ask you to run. You're among the best and the brightest. Uh, I don't need to tell you that, but you are. And that's what the country needs now. We need people who have the values that you have, have the brains that you have, but also, if you're in public health or in health-related fields, I, I think you have the heart. 
And that's what we need in public office today. If you all went down to Washington, D.C., you'd clean it up in the next six months. I have no doubt in my mind. But here's my question to you. Here's my question to you. If not you, then who? If you're not willing to do it, who will? And let me just assure you, they're not sharing your values. They're not up to what you're up to. And they will impact your life. Whether you're going to be able to drive a car, whether you're going to be able to have clean air, clean water, kids educated, all depends on who you elect. So you can't sit on the sideline on this. This is you in the game, playing the game, making it happen. So I, I can't tell you more. I mean, when, when I thought about coming as a fellow, I thought, they don't need me. They need somebody. Much. And I got here, and I thought to myself, I've seen the polls. Seriously, your generation isn't willing. I, I know we've left you some baggage, and I, for that I apologize, OK? <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, you are the people that deserve to be in public office. What's a day in a governor's life like? Amazing, fun, exciting. You wake up in the morning, you say, am I even going to do my calendar today, or is something going to sweep me away? You get out there, you get charged, you go do whatever it might be. Or if you just do the routine calendar, every hour is a different subject. The intellectual challenge is amazing. How fun. But at the end of the day, end of the day, how many places can you say, I did something good today? I know I've made it life better for some people. I've saved some lives. I've given kids health care. I've given a shot at kids to go to college. I've made it better for a senior citizen. How many people can say that? Only you. So if not you, then who? My, I came here to ask you to run. Okay. Governor Chris Gregoire, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you.